Now, Garden of Science being so interdisciplinary, it has several different histories. So we'll be tracing the history of, for example, the science of psychology in a later lecture. But to begin with, we're going to go back to the fundamentals and note that as long as people have been thinking about themselves and their place in the world, as long as they've been doing anything that we might call philosophy or even thinking scientifically, trying to understand things, the question of how we come to know the world has always arisen. So we're going to trace a little bit of the philosophy of mind in, past, in the past, primarily as it has been developed within a European Western framework. But such questions have been developed in uh, many parts of the world. And as we'll find out later on, a lot of the issues that are debated in philosophy of mind have been debated, debated in, particularly in India, in their religious and philosophical schools as well. But we're going to stick largely for now to the Western European uh, tradition of philosophy of mind, which is, of course, the ground in which scientific modernity arose as well. And we're only going to look at the last few hundred years in which many, many philosophers, thinkers of all stripes and scientists have addressed the question of how we come to know the world. What are we that we might know the world? What is the world that we might know it? Uh, cognition is always concerned with knowing. And throughout those several hundred years, we can identify two big poles if you like, two big centers of concern, which we're both beholden to. On the one hand, we know that we come to know the world in part through our senses and through direct experience, through seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. Um, so there's this immediacy of experience and the role of the senses that we need to take into account. And that's going to always be of relevance. On the other hand, we know also by applying our intellect, using reason, even developing the tools of logic and mathematics. And we know some of what we know, at least in a more abstract sense than the immediacy of experience, which is always grounded in a body. We learn, for example, to see particular things as examples of larger classes of things. We don't just see this cat, we see a cat, and we recognize with that its similarity to other cats. So there's always a bit of a tension between these two. Those questions that implicate the senses, experience, and observation are empirical questions. They have to do with what we observe. Those questions that uh, lead us to ask about the role of reason and deduction and the intellect, they are rationalist questions. Now, these are not two football teams. It's not the case that one is right and one is wrong. It's that when we inquire into the position of the knower, these concerns arise. And we might as well get used to them because this contrast will be with us throughout the module. On the empiricist side, we're emphasizing the arising of knowledge from direct experience and observation. And we might note that empirical science, science is, of course, an empirical activity itself. It observes the world and tries to figure out. It takes measurements and tries to model and understand the world. And science can always be corrected. So that knowledge gained empirically is never 100% certain. You can always be mistaken. You could see something and think it's a snake and then the light changes and it turns out it's only an old rope. So knowledge obtained through the senses is never entirely certain. Mathematics has a particular role to play here. Mathematics is not an empirical science. Unlike physics and chemistry and biology, it is not an empirical science. And quite how mathematics relates to science is a subject of ongoing controversy. Mathematical knowledge is often deemed to be some of our most secure and certain knowledge, but quite what it's about, apart from saying mathematics is about mathematics, is another question. Rationalist concerns focus on the application of reason and the principles of logic 
to derive true statements about the world. Now here mathematics provides a, a great guide because derivation of results in mathematics seems to follow by necessity, but as, as we said, quite what it's about other than being about mathematics is not entirely clear. Rationalists valorize or particularly like certain knowledge. So it's always the exclusion of the untrustworthy and trying to steer towards the most secure grasp we can possibly have. And so among the rationalists, we'll see a certain, as it were, distaste or distrust sometimes of the senses um, because sensory experience is often mistaken, doesn't provide true, necessarily provide true statements about the world, and so it might be a poor basis for reason, reasoning. Um, so the first character we're going to look at here is René Descartes, who lived at the start of the 17th century in France. A mad time to live. There was religious wars going on throughout Europe. There was witches being burnt. Um, the there was wars going on, um, primarily, uh, this is after the Protestant Reformation um, and the religious politics got mixed, uh, religious, religion and politics were entirely mixed up in Europe and you had to be very careful where you said what you said. Descartes was a Catholic philosopher in France and he's going to be the figure we associate most strongly with rationalism. He was also a very fine mathematician he had lots and lots of talents, but it's principally his philosophy of mind that we're interested in. And as a rationalist, then he is, gives us the clearest example of what rationalist concerns are. He says, how can we know anything for sure? Now, as we said, when we think about how we know things through the senses, we're forced to admit that sometimes the senses can deceive us. Here's, for example, a visual display, which, if it's working, may appear to move for you while it's not actually moving. So it's an optical illusion. We'll have lots of optical illusions later in this course. Um, but it demonstrates the fact that you can't always trust what you see. So the senses can be fooled. So Descartes adopts a strongly sceptical position. Now, he does this rhetorically. I don't believe he believes his senses are so poorly informed that they're not reliable. But he's pursuing a particular argument. He wants to get at the, the most certain thing he can think of. And so knowing that the senses are fallible means he's going to try and discard the senses and see what's left. Um, and for him, reason is the, in his understanding, reason is a human faculty that sets us apart from the beast. Um, and it's reason that provides us with our most secure grip on the world. Let's read him. He's quite, unlike modern philosophers, he's actually quite easy to read, oh, Descartes is. So let's read a little bit of him. Here he says, suppose for the sake of argument that I have convinced myself that there's absolutely nothing in the world, no sky, no earth, no minds, no bodies. Strange thing to do, but there you go. Let's just suppose it. Now, does it follow that I too do not exist? So I can doubt, for example, the existence of Paris. I can't see Paris from here. Maybe it's all made up. But can I doubt my own existence? No, he says, if I convinced myself of something, then I certainly existed. But suppose there's a deceiver of supreme power and cunning who is deliberately and constantly deceiving me. What a thought experiment, huh? In that case, I too undoubtedly exist if he is deceiving me. And let him deceive me as much as he can. He will never bring it about that I am nothing, so long as I think that I am something. So after considering everything very thoroughly, I must finally conclude that this proposition, I am, I exist, is necessarily true whenever it is put forward by me or conceived in my mind. Now, if you've never met philosophy before, it might be a bit surprising to see someone working so hard to come up with something so obvious. It's given rise to what is far and away the most famous statement in philosophy, cogito ergo sum, often called, I think, therefore I am. And I hope you understand his point. His point is that he maybe is deluded, but even in his delusion, there is someone to be deluded. 
Um, the Latin for I think therefore I am is cogito ergo sum. And Descartes clearly believed that reason played the key role in understanding what it was to be human. Specifically, he said, the further the mind is taken away from its proper object, logic and pure reason, the more likely it is to fall into error. So if you're occupied with daydreaming or with counting sheep or with going about your daily business, you can get things wrong all the way. But if your mind can be disciplined to um, be concerned with logic and pure reason, that's where certainty, he believes, is generated. He says the purpose of philosophy, again as Descartes sees it, is to direct the mind away from the confusing images of the senses towards the indubitable truths contain, contained within the mind itself. So remember our discussion of the, the word physical and its sense of indubitable, something you cannot doubt. For Descartes, reason is the way to arrive at indubitable truths. Now, as blindingly obvious as the statement, I am, is, nonetheless, the way he develops it leads to, to a rather peculiar starting place for the whole of science. Descartes is led to believe that mind is entirely distinct from the material universe. And in particular, he espouses what we call a form of dualism, in which the real is divided into two separate camps. There's the mental and the physical. Now, we mentioned before that for us, this will not be a simple distinction. But for De Descartes is the guy who stuck his neck out and said, what if it is a simple distinction? Mind is very different from stuff. Stuff that takes up space that you can trip over and hit yourself with is not of the same nature as mind. Mind is quite unlike tables and teapots, is invisible. It doesn't have dimensions. It's immaterial. And he says it's unchanging and indivisible without limit. Now, I'm not sure how you can check these because we're not clear what he's talking about. But Descartes is trying to found a form of inquiry in which mind and material are clearly separate. Now, under the material, we'll use the word physical in this particular sense, meaning just made out of matter. And for him, the mental and the physical material are seen as different kinds of things. The Latin word for thing is res, and he calls the material stuff res extensa, which means stuff that takes up space. And he calls the mental res cogitans, which means stuff that thinks. But mind and matter must interact if we're ever going to have an account for how I do anything. It's not enough to say I exist, but I also clap my hands and I cook the dinner. I move around and in doing so I'm moving a material body and interacting with material things. So somehow they have to interact. If I want to do something, a kind of a mental thing, I decide to do something, a mental thing, and then I do it. I pick up the teacup. Now the material stuff has moved. So these, the mental and the physical, have to interact somewhere. Now Descartes didn't know how this was possible. He couldn't blame the brain for everything. The brain, after all, is a physical thing. It's made of matter. There was a part of just beneath the brain, a little gland called the pineal gland, whose purpose was not well understood at this time. Um, you can find out where it is roughly by pointing to yourself. If you point to yourself like this, where those lines intersect is roughly where the pineal gland is. So that's kind of a natural suggestion that, well, I feel I'm most strongly associated with this point rather than, say, the tip of my finger. So maybe that's where the magic happened. Now, Descartes, as fine a philosopher as he is, did not solve this problem. And nobody accepts the idea that mind and matter are two different kinds of substances. That didn't work out for Descartes and it hasn't worked out since. But it's very useful to have this landmark position so that we can compare, for example, other arguments to it. Okay, well, we're going to look, stick with this strange initial move in the philosophy of mind in the next lecture too and talk a bit about metaphysics.